Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before we get started with anything, please take a look at your screen and wish all of these beautiful souls a happy birthday. From myself and the Back to Ashes family to everyone born in June, I hope you've had a very special day and you enjoy your birthday. Oh, and Nick Schaefer's fur baby, give him a boop on the nose for me. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows, please come forward if you like what you are hearing and show that subscribe button some love. And make sure you turn your notifications to all, that way you don't miss any of the upload that happens right here on Back to Ashes daily. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all that information can be found down below. If you have any stories that you would like narrated on this channel, please send them to my email at backtoashes, the number two, at gmail.com. Or it can be a story from something that has happened to you or around you, just as long as it's a true story. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Firstly, I'm a 24-year-old guy, and I'm not great at writing things out like this, but I just wanted some advice, as I'm a socially awkward person. So I decided to go into town the other day and took the train in. I arrived at the station, got my ticket, then waited for the train. I was approached by a man, I'd say maybe in his 60s. I must have been someone he knew or seen before because he said, Wow, I haven't seen you in some time. I replied, Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I think you have the wrong person. He continued to push the conversation by saying, Oh, no, you must have a twin. I laughed and brushed it off. Once the train arrived, I got on and sat down. I sat down in a two-seater chair. The man sat down right next to me and asked me my name. Trying to be nice, I replied my name, and he said his name. He asked me a few questions, and I gave answers. All up to this point, he was fine. He asked if he could use my phone to make a call, which I didn't see any issue with. After this, he sent a text message, which was fine. His phone beeped. He then turned to me and said, I have your number now. We can catch up later. He had called himself on my phone to get my number. I tried to play it off coolly, but I was pretty creeped out, and I couldn't leave since he'd blocked me in. Finally, he got off his station. Straight away, he texted me, and each day has been texting me to come over to his house or go out for a coffee. I felt bad for him because he seemed lonely, but it just really, really was odd and creepy. I just wanted some people's thoughts, as I've never been in this situation before and don't really have friends to talk to about this. Oh, a uh, quick update here. I really appreciate all of everyone's help and responses to this story. I have blocked him after a small exchange. I was trying to be nice, then I tried to ignore him, but he became aggressive and called me and became verbally aggressive. I will be reporting this to the police and changing my number. Thank you all for listening to my story. For context, I live in a small trailer court in central Wisconsin, and directly next to us is a railway that goes across the whole state and leads to a Wally World if you head down for 20 minutes. 
I was a teenager in eighth grade at the time, with no car or transportation, other than my bicycle. The railroad tracks go in a straight line directly leading to Walmart. So, if I were to bike to the Walmart, it takes me about the same time as if I walked straight down the tracks. So, more often than not, I would walk as I was never really a big fan of riding bikes as I have had back issues since a young age. On this date in particular, I decided to head to Walmart for dumb kid stuff shortly before the sun was about to set. This detail will come into play later. Basically, I went to the store and got distracted just looking around, bought some food and drink and some trading cards, but I left as the sun was going down. It's about a 20 to 25 minute walk home, and I decided to head down the tracks again. At about a 10 minute mark, it was getting really dark, and I was a generally fearful and anxious child due to my autism. I was scared of the dark until I was about 14 and a half and would often have nightmares or see things that weren't there in my closet or dark corners, etc. So, as it became too dark to see, I was getting extremely nervous and hypervigilant. Five minutes later, I could have sworn I was hearing footsteps crunching in the rocks lining these tracks that weren't mine. I stopped a few times to listen and confirm someone was indeed walking towards me from a significant distance away. I could see them at this point because of the darkness and lack of light across the railroad tracks. I had no phone or flashlight of any kind. At this point, I started freaking out internally. At first, I didn't know what to do. But as the sound of the footsteps got closer, I decided to call out and let them know I was coming towards them. I stopped as I did this and said something along the lines of, Is someone there? While I know this might seem silly as an adult, but I was used to my brain playing tricks on me in the dark and I was convinced I was hearing things. No response. At this point, the footsteps were getting closer, but still difficult to distinguish over my own. So, I stopped. The footsteps continued for a brief moment, and then they stopped too. I called out again, and I said, Hello? Is anyone there? No response again. I was still prepubescent, so I had a child's voice still. I feel like any reasonable adult would have responded and said, yes, or yeah, I'm just walking, or whatever, as I had genuine noticeable fear in my voice. After I received no response again, I told myself I was just imagining it and continued on my journey. At this point, being just under 15 minutes from my house, and I heard them again, footsteps coming closer as soon as I started walking. At this point, fear took over, and I started yelling and making whooping noises, thinking it might be some sort of animal. I yelled things such as, I know you're there, and I have a knife, which was total bullshit, but thought it might encourage the person to respond. Still, nothing. A few times as I was speaking, I would hear the footsteps stop again. Finally, about three to five minutes later, stopping multiple times and hearing his footsteps stop. Sorry, I can't give a super specific time frame. I was in total fight or flight mode, scared out of my mind, so it gets a little hazy from here. I start seeing this guy materialize out of the darkness. He had on blue jeans, a dark hoodie, with the hood completely masking his face from a distance. I was instantly relieved for whatever reason. Relieved to know I wasn't crazy, maybe, I don't know. And began verbal vomiting to this guy that I was just scared, and I don't know that he was on the tracks for sure. He again did not reply, 
and this was before mainstream Bluetooth audio, and I didn't notice any headphone cables, even when I passed him. Because he didn't respond, I was eyeing him warily as he approached and we locked eyes. I'll never forget the chill that ran down my spine. He was staring at me coldly and blankly, with a menacing look on his face, like he was thinking about doing something. He had his hands shoved in his pockets, and as I was passing him, he looked like he was going to pull something out of his jeans in his right hand. I was a very scrawny kid, and even though I had back problems, I was fast as hell. I just hurt from running for too long. From then on, going down the tracks at a full sprint, it was all a blur. I tripped and fell twice, as well as soaked myself in mud when I tried to get across the small ditch separating the truck from the trailer park and got home. I never told my mom and I never walked on those tracks at night again. After reading through this again, I thought I would describe the tracks a bit for context. They are on an elevated hill next to the trailers and you can either walk a minute in the wrong direction to get on it at the main road I live on or you can cut through this one small spot where some people had put a board down for that exact purpose to get across the ditch and onto the tracks. The board was broken in half and partially submerged, so I was kind of like, you had to jump and land on the board with one foot and then kick off to the other side. The ditch is maybe three feet across, so it's not a huge jump, but it always has nasty standing water in it. Once you get on the other side of the tracks, there is a super long stretch with absolutely no way off other than private property of a factory the railway delivers goods to, which you can get in trouble for trespassing on. Then there's a junction about 20 minutes down and another five minutes from there, which is where Walmart is. Due to this, I couldn't just get off the tracks when I ran away. I had to get to the ditch before I would be able to. This is my first time ever telling the story. It's not really creepy, but it's very disturbing. It was the last year in summer. I had just moved into my new apartment in a bigger city, and me and some of my friends planned on having a barbecue party at a lake nearby. I was very happy that day. I remember and even went to H&M beforehand to get myself a new cute dress to wear that evening. We hadn't bought some things yet, like paper plates and some forks and knives, so my friend and me wanted to go buy them. Nothing special. I got into my car and drove to the train station, where I waited for my friend to arrive. Because it was so hot that day, I parked my car under a bridge in a parking lot and left my windows a little rolled down and thought nothing of it. When suddenly, some dude approached my car. He came walking relatively fast, who looked weird, but again, nothing special. He then proceeded to politely ask me how to get to the special shop, which seemed a little weird to me because I had never heard of that shop before, and also, I just moved here. And finally, I told him, um, sorry, I don't know, I'm gonna Google it for you, just give me a sec. And he thanked me and introduced himself. He said, Hi, I am redacted. And who are you? And reached for my hand. He overall seemed like a nice dude. A little strange, but nice. I was a little skeptical, but also introduced myself. I found the shop, but it was far from where we were standing. And it was closing soon. He wouldn't have time to get there. I said, So the shop is far away and it's closing in a few minutes so unfortunately I guess she won't make it there in time. He kind of just nodded and didn't say anything. He paused a little and began talking of why he wanted to go there. He 
He told me that he had accidentally got his girlfriend pregnant. I didn't want to talk to him any longer because something felt wrong. So I just said something like, Oh, well, and stared into nothing. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see that he began touching his crotch with his left hand whilst talking to me. His voice started to sound very weird, like his nose was clogged. I glanced at him for a second, and he leaned onto my window. I did not say anything at all for a moment, and just thought of how my friend was supposed to already be here, but she wasn't. He looked around the inside of my car, and he must have seen the paper bag from H&M on the back seat because he continued asking if I had bought something nice to wear already. It was only when it was only then. It was only then when I realized that this guy probably didn't have a girlfriend and only needed an excuse to talk to younger girls. He was a skinny older dude, probably in his 50s with a receding hairline and sweat stains on his gray shirt. His pants were orange and dirty and he was wearing flip-flops. It was also at this moment I realized I shouldn't trust people only because they seem nice. I told him that yes, I bought something for myself. I kept my answers very short and told him that I had to go now. But he didn't seem to care and interrupted me and he kept touching his dick. He asked me where I was from and I looked up at him and lied. I couldn't tell this weird man who used me as some sort of fucked fantasy where I really was from because at this point I was really getting scared. He nodded again and started talking about his imaginary girlfriend again and how they really didn't want a baby yet. Then he started drooling. He asked me if I wanted baby soon and I obviously said no because even if I had wanted to, I wouldn't tell this dude. His drooling was getting out of control, and that's when I started the motor and told him that I really had to go, and I drove off. All I heard him shout after me was, I wish you'd have my babies, and he hissed at me and licked his lips. I drove far into the opposite direction that he went and parked my car in a corner. I immediately called my friend to tell her why she had to walk a little bit because I really did not want to come back there. She of course understood. Fortunately, I moved two months later again into another city because of other reasons and I never saw him again. I don't even want to know what would have happened if I had rolled my window down a little more or something. I hope Nobody ever, ever meets this guy. I haven't said much lately, but I'm ready to share my story. I live in a tough community with a high crime and murder rate, so I have seen a lot of crazy shit. Anywho... I used to take the train into the city for work, and on a regular day, I would park my car in the garage at the train station because this option was much quicker and saved me the wear and tear on my already struggling car. On this day, my car was in the shop getting worked on, so I had my girlfriend drop me off at the train station and asked my father to pick me up in the evening. Now. My father is notorious for being late, and despite my telling him, I would be there 30 minutes before my train arrived when I got into the platform and he was nowhere to be seen. I called him asking how long he would be, and he gave me the typical grunt and responded, uh -huh, soon. I took a seat on a bench, prepared to wait when I was approached by a man in a business suit. This was not an uncommon sight because many businessmen and women rode the bus every day. He walked up to me and asked if he could sit for a moment. He had his phone in his hand and kept looking at it, putting it to his ear periodically, clearly checking if he could hear anything on the line. 
As he sits, he looks at me and says, I hate these iPhones. They never work when you need them to. I look back and just give him a nod and say, Ah, uh, yeah, I know. He tells me he just interviewed at his dream job in the city, and the employer told him he would contact him with an answer around this time. He then asked if I could do him a favor and give his phone a call to make sure he had service and to be sure his phone was working properly. Really not thinking anything of it, I agreed and handed him my phone. I'm not afraid of him running away with it because while he is a grown man, I am not little and am confident I would beat the shit out of this guy. He dials away and without hesitation his phone rings and a thought pops into my head. That sneaky son of a bitch. He just wanted my number. I should explain why I immediately thought of this. Long stories and encounters short, I apparently have some look gay men are attracted to. I have been approached on multiple occasions, and I have asked if by looking at me, if they think I'm gay. Most say no, but they feel comfortable trying. A compliment at its core, but happens more than I am comfortable with. As this guy in the suit is pretending to be relieved that his phone works, I am not angry at him. I thought it was a little clever and shrugged it off as, ha ha ha, you got me. He gives me my phone back and I open it up pretending to look at something important, hoping he would go away. He never did. He just sat there watching me. I was getting uncomfortable. And when I am put into a situation, my general response is impulsive, and I want to fight. I am not homophobic or anything, but he was like three inches away from me and just kept looking at me. I could feel my blood pumping. I started to repeat to myself, keep it up, I'm going to bite your face off. I have a much bigger bark than bite, but confidently say if... If you get on my wrong side, I will swing at you. I look at him and ask if there was anything else he needed, and that fucking creep didn't flinch. Just sat there looking at me with a stupid grin on his face. I think he knew I was on to him, and he thought it was funny. It wasn't. To my amazement, before I told this guy to go fuck off, my father pulls up, and I quickly get to my feet and walk towards the car, not acknowledging him or looking back. My father makes a joke when I get into the car, asking if that was my boyfriend, because of the way he was looking at me. I laugh and say no. Not a chance in hell I was going to tell my father what the creep was up to. I did this for the creep's sake. My father is a very hard man. Prison, beaten, shot, has found God, and is a wonderful man. Now that is, but not the man you would want to piss off, especially when it comes to his children. Later that night, I was writing a paper for college when my phone rings. I don't recognize the number, but it only takes me a second to realize it's that guy. And so I answer. Hello? Hi. Have a missed call by this number? Uh, sorry, man. I don't know. Must have dialed the wrong number. Are you sure? I feel like I recognize your voice. I think we know each other. Uh, I don't know you and don't recognize your voice. You've got the wrong number. Ah, uh, I'm telling you, I think I know you. Where do you live? Maybe we're neighbors. Okay, guy, I know who this is and didn't want to be mean. I know what you are doing, but I'm not interested. Please do not call me again. Satisfied, I did not lose my cool. I went back to my paper and initially forgot about the call. About 10 minutes after the call, I got a text message saying something about how he will take care of me. Still on my I'm not going to lose it mode, 
I just laugh and block the number. Fast forward a few months. I am with a friend getting a coffee and my phone goes off. Says I have a voicemail and I still don't know how I got it without my phone ringing. When I listen to the voicemail recorded, it sounds something like, Hello, Chris. This is Dr. Smith. I want to confirm our appointment tomorrow and let you know we have changed offices. My secretary is on vacation, so if there is no response, just be aware your appointment has been moved to tomorrow and our new office is located. I listened to the voicemail and thought, shit, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. However, professional the voicemail sounded, I didn't feel right about it. For one, I had no clue who Dr. Smith was and I don't remember making any appointments. I was really trying to figure it out. I was even going as far as thinking my insurance requires a yearly physical or something. I listened to the voicemail a few more times, and on the third or fourth time, it hit me. I don't know how, but I recognized his voice. The man from the train station. I told my friend, and he suggested we drive by the address he listed. When we arrived, we were at those old mill buildings. The area I live in is historic for its mills during the Industrial Revolution and recently have not been a lot of construction, renovating them into offices and apartments, so nothing stood out yet. We parked outside. I needed to see the fifth floor, like the voicemail said. We didn't need to go all the way up to the fifth floor to see this building was completely empty. I was surprised we could walk in. No bells rang when looking at the rustic interior of the building because even the finished mills had preserved that old look on the outside. However, on the inside, this place is deserted and falling apart. You can tell homeless people stay here because There were a few dirty mattresses and other signs people have been there. My friend and I looked at each other and both let out a small wail and ran out of there half scared, half laughing. However, when we get back to the car, I was not laughing anymore. I was pissed and to this day, I wish I reacted more responsibly. I should have called the police and tried to set him up, but instead, I called him back, and when he answered, I immediately told him to drop the act. I told him I wasn't going to call the police, but when or if I ever saw him, I would murder him. I was screaming into the phone, telling him all the horrible ways I would take his life if he kept it up. I never heard from him again, And I can honestly admit, after my anger went away, I considered the full scope of what he had planned, and it shook me up for days. What on earth had he had planned? What on earth had he had planned? What would he have done to me? Rape me? Murder me? Please, I need opinions here. I am so lost and still very scared. I've been thinking about this story a lot. I had a nightmare about it recently, and after telling it to my BF for the first time, he said that maybe writing about it will help. I often do write to cope with things, and I figured I might as well get a little karma out of this story. So, this story takes place about 10 years ago. I was 14 at the time. I grew up on an old farm houses far away on a rural road. Cornfields surrounded our home and our closest neighbors were two to three miles away. The closest town was a 15 minute drive. One thing that was really nice about living out there was that you didn't get a lot of strangers knocking on your door to sell or talk religion with you. But 
We did get a few. One night, it was just my mother and I home, making baked goods for a fundraiser for my little brother's Boy Scout troop. Dad and brother were out helping my uncle with some cows, if I remember that right. We were bustling around the kitchen, talking and laughing. Mom and I have always been very close. Soon, we heard a knock at the door, just a normal average knock, a uh, tap, tap, tap. Mom hmmed to herself and took off her disc gloves to open the door. I stood at the kitchen island rolling out some dough for a couple of pies, but also watching my mother go to the door. I had a slight twinge of anxiety in my stomach, but chalked it up as being one of the normal flurries. As my mom walked towards the door, the person on the other side gave another tap, this time in a rhythm. Tap to tap tap, tap tap. My mom stopped. She turned and started walking back into the kitchen with a look on her face. She went to her kitchen window that faced out towards the porch. She went to the side where you'd be able to see the porch clearly. Mom pulled the curtain back just enough to peek and it not be noticed from the outside. The look on her face deepened. She went to the other side of the window then to look out at the driveway. I had stopped what I was doing altogether at this point, deciding that the pie crusts probably weren't important in this moment as the feeling in my stomach was in a full-blown fury. Mom's eyes widened as she looked out. She closed the curtain and locked the front door. The look on her face was angry, but also scared. She walked over and grabbed my wrist. She walked us to the closet, and as she quietly asked me if I had my cell phone, I did. She pulled out one of my dad's prized Louisville Slugger out of the closet. The person at the door started banging. The door, more hard this time. I gasped a bit. Mom looked at me and shushed me. She then took my arm again and walked me towards my parents' bedroom, locking doors and windows as we went. At one point, she stopped at a window in our living room and peeked out of it. She closed it quickly and let out a frustrated noise. We got to the bedroom, and she pulled me in and locked the door. She took my phone and began dialing as she gave me the bat, sat me down on the floor on the side where I'd be hidden from the door, and opened the closet to get to the gun case. She talked quietly on the phone. I was terrified and couldn't focus on what she was saying. She pulled out my dad's shotgun and loaded it quickly. I looked at her, scared, as she hung up. She pulled me up again and walked me out of the bedroom. We crept back over to the other side of the house, where the bathroom was. Mom gave me my phone and ushered me inside. She set the gun. She set down the gun and looked at me with both hands on my shoulders. Sis... You need to listen to me. There are some men outside, and they're walking around the side of the house. I looked at her with wide eyes. I could feel myself shaking. Why? What do they want, Mom? I don't know, but you need to stay in here. Lock the door, and don't come out until I tell you to. Do you understand me? I nodded and she squeezed my shoulders. I'm going to barricade the door from the other side. I will not move the barricade until I let you know that it's me. I knew what she was saying immediately. Crawl out the bathroom window and run if it's moved otherwise. My mom shut the door and I quickly locked it. I heard her move the quilt chest in front of the door, a very heavy box with lots of quilts from over the years. I sat on the floor in front of the window, clutching the baseball bat. I sat there for what seemed like hours, but was actually five minutes. 
When I sat there, I heard footsteps outside the window. Two deep voices quietly talking. Are you sure they're in there? Maybe nobody's home. No, that's at least two women in there. I heard them talking at the door. Saw a guy and a kid leave when we passed the house earlier. I shivered and started to hyperventilate, but quickly covered my face with a towel to mute it. Who are they? What do they want? Why were they here? Soon I heard another loud voice. Guys, let's go, Charlie. Spotted cop down the road. Then I heard three sets of feet running off towards the front of the house. I was crying at this point, tears pouring down my face. Was it over? Were they leaving? A few more minutes go by and I hear a man's voice in the house. I start to panic and huddled in the corner of the bathroom. I heard my mom's voice on the other side of the bathroom door. Sis, it's me. The sheriff's here. They're gone. I'm going to move the trunk, okay? I got up and unlocked the door and opened it to find the sheriff and my mom moving the trunk out of the way. I quickly ran into the arms of my mom and we just stood there holding each other. The sheriff said he had a few more officers chasing down the van and that he needed to ask my mom and I some questions. My mom nodded and we walked into the kitchen where the smell of burnt cookies was in the air. The sheriff asked us questions and that when I found out what my mom saw. When she looked out and saw the man who was knocking at our door, she knew something was off immediately. He was casually dressed, gym shorts and a wife beater. Not something a salesman or people of a church would wear when coming around. So. Then my mom thought that maybe his car broke down, or maybe he was looking for help. So she looked out the window and saw something that made her stomach drop. There was a white van parked in a way that wouldn't allow my mother's car to leave. With a man in the passenger seat and another leaning in towards the front of the van, taking to the passenger side guy. But mom noticed that even that both were sitting still, the van was still slightly rocking, like there were more people inside. As my mom and I were finishing up with the sheriff, a deputy walked in. He looked pale. He looked at my mom, the sheriff, and me. Deputy, sir, we are able to catch up with the van. They lost control and swerved into the ditch eventually. Huh. Any side of those bastards being hurt? Uh, no, sir, they're all fine, but, um, we do have them in custody. The sheriff quirked an eyebrow. There were five men in that van. We asked them what they were doing out here and what they walked around the house like they did for. Sheriff, and what did they say? Said they were vacuum salesmen, sir that they were a team out trying to sell their product they made. The sheriff scoffed a bit. Huh. Well, Jones ended up checking the van and, well... Well, what? Do we have a drug bust or something? The deputy gulped and looked at my mom and me again. No, sir, that's not what we found out at all. They took my mom outside and told her what they had found. She was horrified and came in sobbing and holding me. After that, they phoned my dad and he came rushing home. My other uncle, a mountain of a man, stayed that night just in case. Mom and dad spared no expense on the home security system after that night and taught both of us kids how to shoot and load a gun. My aunt and uncle gave us one of their German Shepherd puppies as well. Mom had him trained to be an attack dog, though you wouldn't be able to tell. 
when not in defense. He was a dopey, lovable, just all-around cuteness type of buck. This still wasn't enough to settle mom, though, and brother and I ended up going to self-defense lessons as well. My cousins were sent with us. It wasn't until a few years later I found out what was in the van. Coincidentally, we were making cookies and other homemade candy for a Christmas party. I finally asked my mom about it. She was shocked that I asked, but knew I'd find out eventually. So, what they found in the van, they found rope, tape, burlap sacks, and even sedatives, as well as guns and what the police described as burner phones. When they had taken all the guys back and after hours of questioning, one of them broke and said that they were having no luck in nabbing anyone in town. So they went out to the rural areas. The closest town is a very tight-knit community where everybody watches each other's back. This terrified me. I would never have guessed. To this day, I'm very careful about whom I open my door for, and I can't sleep unless I have some sort of weapon in the bedside table. It's really shattered my trust in other people as well. I go out and automatically assume most people are going to hurt me. My therapist is trying to help me with this. I sincerely hope that I never have to go through a situation like that ever again. I'm 41, but when I was 20 years old, I attended a college in Northeast Pennsylvania. I lived off campus and had a part-time job at the local mill. The mall was just over a mile away, and I would walk to and from work regularly. The mall generally closes at 9, and I would finish my closing tasks and start walking home at around 9.30 or 10 p.m. at the latest. Occasionally, I could get a ride home with a co-worker, but most of them were high schoolers getting picked up by their parents. One night, I was walking my familiar route home. There were never many people out and about downtown until I get back onto the campus, which I would cross to get home. This night, I was only a few blocks from the mall. I noticed a van parked on the next corner, but didn't think anything of it initially. There were always a smattering of cars parked everywhere. The van appeared to be running. The headlights were on. As I got a bit closer, I noticed the sliding door on the van was open. I definitely noticed, but assumed someone must be loading something in or out of one of a local businesses along the street. As I started to walk past the van, there was a sudden flurry of movement on my left. There had apparently been a man crouched behind a dumpster there, and he was running straight at the open van door. The scary part was that I was directly between them and that open van door. He was trying to shove me into the van. I screamed, and I can only credit my complete awkward lack of coordination for what happened next. I tripped and stumbled when he surprised me. So, when he hit me, I was already sort of falling to the ground. The force he hit me with only got my head and shoulders into the open door, while the majority of my body was outside on the ground. I remember he grabbed me around the waist and was trying to hoist me up and through the door. But I was just discombobulated, dead weight. He jumped over me into the van, grabbed a handful of my hair, and started to pull me off the ground and into the van. This is when headlights from a car turning down the street washed over me, and I could briefly see this was the white guy in the black hoodie. 
When I saw the car, I screamed louder and started wildly flailing my arms. I heard their brakes screech, and the guy let go of my hair. I jumped back, and the hooded bastard slammed the door shut, and seconds later, accelerated away. A cute little white-haired Polish woman had been in the car that turned down the street at the exact right moment to save me. She hugged me and told me I was safe, and it was then I realized I was still screaming. She sat on the sidewalk with me and then walked me to my car. Cell phones were relatively new. Neither of us had one. She drove me to the police station and stayed with me until I answered all questions and made a report. As far as I know, they never caught the guy. My housemate with a car let me borrow it any time. I was going to work after that, and I never walked around downtown after that. I had nightmares for a while. I can't help but think of what could have actually happened to me in the back of that van. So I work in a restaurant. One night we were short staffed and I had to help on the floor. So the waitresses were just me and a young girl called Anna and our manager, David. Anna was 18 and an absolute knockout. On this cold, dreary Monday night, she still looked like a movie star. It wasn't too busy, so we were going okay. Towards the end of the evening, there were only a couple of tables left, all in my section. So when the last table came in, he was put in Anna's section. The guy was a real hipster, he had a giant beard with a little braid in it. He ordered his meal and pulled out his own bottle of sriracha sauce. He had swallows tattooed on both hands. As Anna took his drink order, I shot her a look as if to say, have fun with that guy. After 40 minutes later, Anna had gone for a smoke, so I asked hipster dude if he wanted anything else. How about your friend's number? I laughed him off and he ordered a refill for his Pepsi. A little while later, Anna comes into the kitchen to find me. She told me that hipster dude had asked what time she got off work. She told him she could go when we closed. He told her he would be waiting for her shift to finish. She said, no, thank you. Hipster dude then said, well, these Pepsis are unlimited, so it doesn't look like you will be getting rid of me anytime soon. As Anna explained all of this, she looked very unsettled. I asked if she wanted me to leave. She said no because her housemates wouldn't be back until late and she had forgotten her door key. So I found David the manager, told him what had happened. He uselessly said he would keep an eye on things. I told the chefs that after Anna's shift had ended, they were both going to walk her to her car. They agreed. Hipster dude left around 10 minutes later. The night finally crawled to an end and Anna waited for the chefs to finish so they could walk her to her car. I got changed and went over to the hospital next door to the restaurant because I needed to pick up some paperwork. As I crossed the car park, I noticed this van. It was black with rust on the side panels. It had blacked out windows. The headlights and engine were on. As I got to the other side of the van, I saw a hand hanging out of the window holding a cigarette, a hand with swallow tattoos. I walked calmly towards the hotel and then sprinted around the building to the back entrance of the restaurant. I found Anna and the chefs just getting ready to leave. He's still here. He is outside waiting in some creepy murder van. Do not go out there. I panted. 
Upon reflection, these probably weren't the right words to have used. Every one of us was panicking by now, save for David, who was in his office. So we came up with a plan. Anna would stay inside by the door with one of the chefs. Me and the other chef would go out to the car park. I would drive Anna's car right up to the door, and she would get in and drive with one of the chefs back to her house. The chef lived near her anyway. The plan went off without a hitch, except for the fact that as soon as Anna's car pulled away, so did the creepy van. I start calling the chef in Anna's car frantically. He's following, I said. He was, said the chef, but we just turned off. He isn't behind us now. Relieved, I walked over to the hotel and spent about 20 minutes sorting out order forms and other paperwork. Helped David lock up and then walked to my car. In the inky blackness of our restaurant car park late at night, I heard the crunching of the gravel underfoot. Then, when I got to my car and stopped walking, the footsteps didn't stop. I heard crunch, 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 and then a whisper. Why couldn't you just let me have her? I leapt into my car, locked the doors, and sped the hell away. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Buzz Crispin, Patty's Knees, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your support. For without you, there would not be a me, and there would not be a Back to Ashes channel. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you are asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourself and stay safe. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.